Uh, welcome to Northwest, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. I am Tom Ott, today's worship associate. My pronouns are he and him. We have the Reverend Peter Gable, an ordained Presbyterian minister, leading our service. Our music will be performed live by the Northwest Singers Choir, directed by Ken Hermanot. Uh, because the COVID risk in Oakland County is currently at a low level, congregants in the sanctuary can sing when, while masked. Alex Myers is both running the AV Tech booth and playing the piano this morning. Please greet your neighbors with a wave from wherever you are before we start our service, and we start with those on Zoom. So if we're switching our Zoom view to gallery, so we can see you wave at us and each other. And now those in the sanctuary can turn to that camera wow. <laughs> and point <laughs> and yeah <laughs> and wave to those in the, in the in attending virtually and then we finally greet each other in the sanctuary by waving good morning everybody Now I put something else added to what was in there, and maybe it was not the right stuff. Well, it's the stuff that was under there. Yeah. yeah. Oh well, I'll write it. I'll write one here. <laughs> Let's pretend this worked. Maybe we got pranked. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Leave us there. 
Okay, our chalice lighting is community chalice lighting by Atticus Palmer. We call this light before us in hope that we may always remain a strong community, working together to make the world a better place. When we are grieving or sad, when we are challenged, when we need help, this flame guides us out of the darkness. When we are cheerful, when we celebrate, when we accomplish a great task, when we return to a place that makes us happy, this, the chalice reminds us to share our happiness with others. Northwest shares 50% of the plate collections with the Southfield Emergency Needs Fund every other month throughout the year. Their goal is to help residents overcome personal hurdles to achieve a satisfying and productive quality of life. Human Services is a division of Southfield Community Relations. Uh, there are three ways to donate, as you can see on the slides. Uh, you can text to 248-574-8032 with your amount plus plate. You can donate online by selecting gift to plate collection, 50% split. And for those of us here in person, you can put checks or cash in the collection box in front of the sanctuary. Um, our first hymn is number 1054, Let This Be a House of Peace.
Well, that was a timely sharing of an Iowa small town story. Liz Lenz, a journalist who lives in a small town in Iowa, writes, it's easy to feel claustrophobic living in a place where people know you. I've sat in my therapist's office and sobbed that everyone knew my business and I felt like I couldn't buy eggs without a weird side eye from a neighbor. My therapist who grew up in the town and is best friends with my doctor understands. But maybe she told me that's just what it means to be from a place. We observe each other's tragedies, losses, and reinventions. And it can be good to be in a place with continuity, to be remembered for who you once were and who you are trying to be. Continuing, continuity can be claustrophobic, but it can also be comfort. And now let us stand and join together in singing let this be a house of peace. Ken Hermanot, our choir director, is going to help us with that. This is one of those famous hymns that's called the Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we thought we would be able to go around today. No reason for a part, but I just made an executive decision that we were going to do it in two groups instead of four. <laughs> because of how many people are in here. We're going to rely on uh, the choir members over here and that side to be one group. And then if, if you could sing with that other group over there, uh, be group number two, and this would be group number one on this side. I had to kind of decide that based on who we met here. And what we, uh, why don't we rise, uh, embody our spirit now, and take a look at what we're going to be singing. It's, it's Building Bridges, number 1023. We're going to sing it all together, all the way through the first time. And then I'm going to start the first group over here. And then two lines later, I'll start the second group over here. And once you've started the round, we'll sing it twice. So each person will sing the, the, all the way through three times, once all together, and twice as a round. Does that make sense, I hope? <laughs> OK, we are ready. Good morning, everyone. I feel like a semi-stranger here. It's been so infrequently I've been able to be here in person. It's wonderful. You know a small you know a town is small when it has an aquarium stocked with live minnows. <laughs> the town is named after everyone's distant relative. You don't signal turns because everyone knows where you're going. No social events are scheduled when the school gym floor is being varnished. You call a wrong number and they supply you with the correct one. People read the paper to see whether the publisher got the facts right. The New Year's baby was born in October. Night on the town takes only 11 minutes. 
at the last beauty contest, nobody won second or third. <laughs> you know, a religious congregation is small when everyone feels they should weigh in on every decision, no matter how trivial. The minister often finds himself pouring oil in the chalice before the service and taking the garbage to the curb. Uh, side note, this isn't always true. I often used to see the Franciscan priests of a sizable Catholic parish in Southfield cutting the lawn on a, on a riding mower. Everyone knows the children. 80% of the expenses are paid by 20% of the people. And the members most aware of it are the, mostly the 20%. The worst thing about a small congregation is that everything is personal, right? Also, the best thing is that everything is personal. All kidding aside, I've got a confession to make. I've never lived in a small town. I've never attended a small congregation before Northwest. What I know about small towns comes from novels, television, movies, and music. Casey Chambers, a singer and song, songwriter from Austin, has a lot to say about small towns. In merry-go-round, she has a somewhat negative view. If you ain't got two kids by 21, you're probably gonna die alone. At least that's what tradition told you, and if don't matter if you don't believe, come Sunday morning, you best be there in the front row like you're supposed to. I see our front rows are <laughs> vacant. Um, same hurt in every heart, same trailer, different park. Mama's hooked on Mary Kay, brother's hooked on Mary Jane, and daddy's hooked on Mary two doors down. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, we get bored, so we get married. Just like dust, we settle in this town on this broken merry-go-round. Well, that's a rather bleak image, of, bleak image of small town life, isn't it? One that persists. And there are bleak images of small congregations, which include a lack of resources, exhausted volunteers, backbiting, rumoring, gossiping, plenty of hurt feelings. And I don't want to stretch our metaphor too far between small towns and small congregations. So I'm going to talk about the most important similarity between a small town and a small congregation. Edward Abbey wrote, one of the pleasant things about small town life is that everyone, whether rich or poor, liked or disliked, has some kind of role and place in the community. This is true in small congregations also. Everyone is important. Everyone is necessary. Everyone is a gift to the community. Everyone is a teacher and a student. Everyone is you know, crucial to the mission of the church. Some con small congregations don't have the luxury of discounting or dismissing some people. We need all hands on deck. Not coincidentally, this aspect of small congregations is reflected in the first principle of UUs, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. If every person in our community has inherent worth and dignity, then everyone in our congregation has an essential role. We cannot afford to be less than fully inclusive. I see our second and third principles flowing out of the first principle. The second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, and the first part of our third principle, acceptance of one another, um, are really the whole thing as far as how we get along with each other. So the first, the first principle informs us that every person has inherent worth and dignity. The second and third principles inform us how to respond to this inherent worth and dignity through justice, equity, compassion, and acceptance of one another. Does that sound, does this all sound difficult? Well, if it doesn't, it should. These highfalutin words, inherent worth, dignity, justice, equity, compassion, and acceptance, well, they're pretty easy to affirm up in our heads, aren't they? I mean, who isn't for these things? Only by putting action into our principles do they become real. Until then, they're just theoretical 
thought experiments. What are some examples of this? Well, I'll start with myself. A few, a few weeks ago, I offended a member of our community with a thoughtless response to a complaint. I only managed a brief inadequate apology to this individual, and I'm responsible for making a greater effort toward reconciliation. Shall I do, I'm not fully living out our principles. This kind of behavior is corrosive to a congregation. You know, it occurs to me now that maybe a half dozen people think I'm talking about them. <laughs> well, the flip side of this is being too easily offended. An accusation too often made by the offender, I'll admit. Still, those of us who feel we've been wrong need to do some serious introspection. Was the offense intended? Do the offenders understand how they've been offensive? Is the offense small enough to ignore? If you've been offended, you may have an obligation to help the offender understand that, how you feel. The least productive thing you can do is avoid these people or worse yet, leave the congregation. I doubt any of our highfalutin principles are unique to UUism. Um, what do some of the world's religions say about the value of each person? In Christianity, the golden rule is often cited in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke writes, do to others what you want them to do to you. This is the meaning of the law of Moses and the teaching of the prophets. Not surprisingly, the golden, golden rule is important to Jews also. Hillel the elder, who lived about around the same time as Jesus, used this verse as the most important message of the Torah for his teaching. Once he was challenged by a Gentile who asked to be converted under the condition that the Torah explained to him while he stood on one foot. So, you know, imagine, tell me the whole thing now. Okay, I can only do this so long. So, Hillel accepted him as a candidate for condition, conversion to Judaism, but drawing on Leviticus 19.18, brief the man, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. The rest of it is explanation. Go and learn. Also, the other major Abrahamic faith, Islam, by the words of the prophet recorded in the Hadith, none of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. According to the Tao Te Ching, and I think this is one of my favorite versions of the golden rule, the sage has no interest of his own, but takes the interest of the people as his own. He is kind to the kind, he's also kind to the unkind. For, the, for virtue is kind. He is faithful to the faithful. He is also faithful to the unfaithful. For virtue is faithful. How about humanism? In the view of Greg Epstein, a humanist chaplain at Harvard University, do unto others is a concept that essentially no religion misses entirely. But not a single one of these versions of the golden rule requires a God. As Chaplain Epstein states, the golden rule is a part of essentially every religion and many ancient philosophies. Now, none of these formulations on how we should treat each other are limited to individual efforts. As we've learned in, from our recent focus on racism, the structural components are often the most difficult barriers to both recognize and correct. The structural barriers to following our principles in a small congregation may include not knowing some people very well, being new to the congregation, not understanding what is up with some people, lack of resources, scarcity of leadership and lack of volunteers, difficulty knowing who has a need and knowing who will help. And there's many more. Taking action on our principles is essential for the survival of our congregation any small congregation, more essential than ever after being battered with multiple years of pandemic and years of major increases in incivility. To add to the challenges, we've been dealing with the departure of a longtime minister and the hardships of replacing her leadership. I trust I speak for plenty of others when I say I'm tired, worried, disconnected, and discouraged. Kudos to everyone who's keeping the plane in the air. Thank you. But it has been a bumpy ride.
We're in danger of being flung apart by centrifugal forces. Our discomfort makes us irritable. We lose patience. We stay away from each other. We don't commit or we reduce our commitment. We make assumptions about others. We assume the worst. We blame, we whine, we feel left out. We've been spending a lot of time on this proposed eighth principle, but in the meantime, we need a little work on our current seven, especially the first three. May I make a few suggestions on where to start? I know what I need to do to do these things as much as or more than anyone. Who do you know in your community that you haven't seen or heard from in a long time? You know, like globe travelers over there. Reach out to them repeatedly. By the way, ditch the text messages. You need to hear each other's voices, at least. Is there a chance you've been offended, that you offended someone but would rather not think about it? Find out for sure and seek reconciliation if necessary. Have you found it all too convenient to join us by Zoom? I'm talking to you guys, which, which is, am I on that camera? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, where was I? Yes, perfectly capable of joining each other. You know, you, even when you're perfectly capable of joining each other in real life, and uh, I understand that's called IRL, that's what the kids tell me. Uh, the technology can be a great tool, but we still need each other's physical presence. Do we need to re-examine our priorities? I suggest that our principles be our priority. What's more important, rules and policies or people? People's dignity, peace and quiet or people's importance? Things always done perfectly or sometimes done less than perfectly, but more inclusively. Always dealing with uncomplicated people or learning to accept someone you find difficult. Let's look deeper into the last suggestion. Learning to accept someone you find difficult. Actually learning, really more than that, learning to appreciate and even cherish people you find difficult. I spoke on this at some length in a sermon here about six years ago. Six years. So I trust everything's been forgotten. <laughs> Since then, I've given this idea more thought, and I'd like to share this concept with you again. The last time I addressed this topic from the pulpit, I messily referred to it as, and I quote, improving our acceptance of one another so we can resist our natural tendency to assume we know what someone else is saying, thinking, or feeling. <laughs> I have a much simpler way to express that now. It's very simple. Everyone is doing the best they can. Now, some of you already want to argue with me, don't you? <laughs> Think of some difficult people in this congregation. No, don't say it out loud. <laughs> Are these people doing the best they can? You might say they aren't even trying to get along. My response is, how do you know they're not even trying to get along? <clears throat> I assert that when somebody consistently does, what someone consistently does is the best that they can do for now. How does this make sense? Well, I'm not speaking literally, first of all, but I think I'm speaking the truth. I'm talking about a paradigm shift, looking at people's abilities completely differently. When we find someone difficult, we find it hard to believe they can't do better. Maybe they can't, at least in that time and place. You have to make the paradigm shift before you can understand it. It is like believing light and motion are constant, as all scientists did before the 20th century, and understanding that light and motion are relative. How do you know that everyone is not doing the best they can? Everyone has disabilities and abilities. I'm not speaking of disabilities from a medical or educational viewpoint or legal. Simply, there are some things each of us is able to do, some things we can only do with great effort, and some things we cannot do at all. For example, I'm pretty good at math. I can do a fair amount of arithmetic in my head, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. However, I'm not very good with visual arts. If you ask me to draw a picture of someone's face, it will become a bit of a mess. 
If I worked extremely hard and extremely slowly, I might be able to come up with something that could be recognized as this person's face, or at least a face. But I could never manage a drawing that would be nearly as good as a 10-year-old with this ability. Finally, there are many things that are beyond my abilities. Although I could dunk a basketball for a few brief shining moments in the prime of my life, I don't think I could jump high enough even to touch the rim now. I don't understand a lick of Mandarin Chinese. These examples may seem rather superficial, they are. Uh, but I know I have some serious consequential partial and full inabilities that seriously impact my life and relationships. Most of which I won't share in this public forum. <laughs> But I'll share one that I find only mildly, mildly humiliating is anyway rather obvious. I'm fat. I find that generally speaking, I don't have the ability to maintain an ideal weight. Several times in my life, I've lost a substantial amount of weight, but I always gained it back. What is this if, if, if not something I cannot do? Well, you might be thinking you could do it if you tried hard enough. Could I? Would I? Perhaps, but the evidence would not be on your side. <laughs> what does this idea of abilities and inabilities have to do with acceptance of one another? The people of this congregation are, are very good at accepting people with differences that we recognize as inherent, supposedly part of their identity. Racial and ethnic differences, no problem. Lesbian, gay, bi, trans, or queer, easy. Christian, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Wiccan, or Baha'i. Though I understand some would like to add a caveat as long as they aren't too religious. In many ways, though, we aren't very good at accepting people who are different. Some people have difficult behaviors. Some who have been currently, who have been or currently are among us. Some people are argumentative. Some cannot stand to lose a disagreement. Some won't give up trying to convince others that their way of doing things is the best, no matter how often it is rejected. Some make sarcastic, biting comments. Some make everything about them. Some gossip and use underhanded methods to get their way. Some use their privilege to try to control others. Well, you get the idea. These behaviors can be hard to tolerate. They can be infuriating. But you, have you ever considered the idea that these are actually inabilities? I'm suggesting that behaviors in others that you find difficult, even upsetting, may happen because that person cannot behave as you wish. Why is he behaving that way? Was it an accident of genetics, childhood experiences, a difficult life, poor parent modeling, extreme life stressors, or even some underlying undiagnosed currently recognized disability label? There may be no way for you to know, but I'm suggesting it is important for you to realize that there are probably many explanations other than this is a terrible person and wants to make me miserable. So what do we do about this? Well, first of all, hang in there. Develop your patience ability. Learn to perceive things through the experience of the person you find difficult. Don't assume you know why she is behaving that way. Assume the best about him. Don't take it personally. I'm not saying these things are easy. Some will find them harder than others. You will have abilities and inabilities in these areas. Do your best. Our little community, our little congregation, you guys up there too. Our little town, everyone is essential. All hands on deck. Everyone recognizing each other's inherent worth and dignity, no matter what their abilities and inabilities, through justice, equity, compassion, and acceptance of one another. And this is for Alex. Make it so. Oh, there's song. Please uh, arise and sing as you are able and willing. Hymn number 1031, filled with loving kindness.
say our words for the chalice of flame extinguishing are the hand in yours by Reverend Erica Hewitt. The hand in yours belongs to a person whose heart is sometimes tender, whose skin is sometimes thin, whose eyes sometimes fill with tears, and whose laughter is a beautiful sound. The hand that you hold belongs to a person who is seeking wholeness and trusts that you're doing the same. As you leave this sanctuary, may your hearts remain open, may your voices stay strong, and may your hands remain outstretched. Thank you. 